Welcome back everyone to the last session of the Mechanism Design for Social Good tutorial on provision and targeting for vulnerable populations. Um, so far on day one, we talked about some of the basics of provision and targeting. And then in the previous session, Sarah showed us some really interesting issues related to um, behavioral considerations and practical implementation. So in this session, we're going to talk about some mechanism design and learning issues related to proxy means testing and community-based targeting. Um, so Sarah will be watching the chat and we'll have a Q&A session after. So um, let me know if you have questions. Okay. So I'll start with proxy means testing and then move to community-based targeting. And to start a discussion of proxy means testing, I wanna first introduce um, a familiar program, Social Security Disability Insurance, which is a US income support program for targeted at people with uh, disabilities that prevent them from working. Um, and this program has, like we've discussed already in this tutorial, pretty arduous uh, application process. So you have a fairly long interview with an evaluator, you have to fill out a bunch of forms, you have to wait five months without doing any gainful work, um, and then you also have a screening based on your medical history. So they ask your doctor and people who know you just how disabled you are. Um, I wanna motivate this session with an observation that there are lots of opportunities and incentives in this process to manipulate it. Um, in particular, there's a fair amount of evidence suggesting that people will reduce the amount they work artificially in, a, in order to obtain eligibility and maintain eligibility for the SSDI program. Moreover, because there are so many forms and other components to this application process, people put a lot of effort into trying to figure out the way to do that part of the process well. And if you want some evidence for this, just Google SSDI application help, and you'll get lots of links, often some of them sponsored. So this isn't just something that happens for SSDI. This happens in lots of other social programs. There's evidence of labor distortion around the income cutoffs in lots of other social programs, US Social Security, um, this second paper talks about a program in the UK. Um, and in PMTs as well, there's concern over manipulation. It's standard practice to try to choose features that are hard to manipulate specifically for this sphere. So I wanna talk about how you should design your targeting procedure if you expect the re possible recipients to manipulate. Um, in particular, you have to choose between a bunch of different features to select on. And each feature has some amount of explanatory power that will help you predict someone's income. And it will have some manipulation cost. And you need to navigate those two aspects of each feature. And the way I wanna do that is by um, framing this through the lens of the literature on strategic classification, specifically starting with a paper of Hart et al. in 2016. So the idea is that we, we're going to treat targeting as a learning problem, where the training that you're using comes from honest data. But then when you go to test the policy that you learned, you're testing it on manipulated data. And here, the data points are individuals in our population, potential recipients of our, of our benefits. Um, so here's what that might look like. So the learning environment will look a lot like a pretty standard learning environment in a lot of computational models. So imagine that each individual has some vector of features. So individuals are points in Rn. And they have an, a, label, a label associated with them, which will be their eligibility. So zero if they are not low income and one if they are eligible and low income. Okay. And in addition, there will be an underlying distribution D joint over the features and people's eligibility. Okay, so here's what the training stage in a pretty typical learning model would look like. You receive M samples, and these samples are labeled. So they're labeled by someone's features and whether or not they are low income. And this is often given to a, so in the proxy means testing setting, you should imagine this as being the survey data that you used to train your proxy means test. So you can imagine that this data is honest data. No one has any mis incentive to misreport in these surveys. And based on this data, you need to select a classifier. In particular, we'll consider linear classifiers since that's what's often used in practice. 
Okay. And now you need to test your linear classifier on fresh data. This is when you're using the classifier to actually determine whether people get benefits. And here's what that would look like in a non-strategic setting. So the learner would draw a fresh data point, x, y, and then their goal would be to maximize the probability that their label matches the true label. So h of x matches y. In a setting with strategic manipulation, though, the test stage would look a little bit different. And here's how. You would still draw a fresh data point. But now this data point, before being classified, would have an option to move to a different set of features. So x would move to a different set of features, z of x. And now you would classify based on what you saw, z of x. So this manipulation would happen for a reason. The objective of our data point would be to maximize a function which depends on a couple of things. So first of all, it's reasonable to assume that a pe person would want to get benefits. So you can write that as an indicator of whether or not they were labeled by the classifier as a one. Um, and they'll, we'll say they get one point for that. You can think about that as being their utility from benefits normalized to one. And then they'll pay a manipulation cost depending on how much they manipulated. So you can imagine C being a function that gets larger the farther Z of X is from X. And importantly, the members of our population will make this manipulation knowing the policy that they're trying to manipulate. So in the strategic classification setting, then what is the learner's objective? They're still trying to maximize the probability that they guess the true label, but now they are maximizing this probability where their guess comes from the manipulated label. And that's the strategic classification setting. Okay, so importantly, we're going to assume that our learner knows the cost function and therefore knows how people will manipulate or can predict that, but doesn't know the underlying distribution of uh, features. Good. So how did all solve this? for a special case of cost functions. Um, they call them separable cost functions. And we're gonna look at a special case, which is what we'll call linearly separable cost functions. So the way a linearly separable cost function works is that it's given a, um, if you're looking at the cost to move from X to Y, the function is parametrized by a vector alpha. And if you move in the direction of alpha, you pay cost in proportion to how much you move. That's what it means to be linearly separable. So as an example, two common things that are used on proxy means tests are how many children are in the household and what is their house made of? How, what quality is the building material? So anecdotally, something that happens occasionally is that someone will find a friend who has a few kids and borrow those kids the day the enumerator comes around. Um, so you could imagine alpha one being the cost of doing that for one kid. And then alpha two could be the cost of manipulating the feature of the build, the quality of your home's building material. And so what you would do is you would add up all of these costs of manipulation. Okay, so in this setting, Hart et al. show that actually you can efficiently learn a near optimal hypothesis. Um, so in particular, the benchmark here is not the best hypothesis overall, but the best, best hypothesis, the best linear classifier with respect to the manipulated data as well. So the optimal classifier will also be manipulated and you're comparing to that. But this optimal classifier knows the true distribution. And the policy they give has a very simple form. Um, so first of all, it's without loss of generality to consider linear classifiers whose decision boundaries are perpendicular to alpha. So they're of the form alpha dot y is at least t. Or alpha dot x. I think that's a mis mistype. So among those classifiers, then there's going to be one that is optimal in the absence of strategic manipulation, T star. And the optimal classifier in the presence of strategic manipulation is what's called the what I'm calling the move the goalposts classifier. So you take that optimal classifier and just move the decision boundary one unit to be more strict. So here's a picture of how that could look. 
um, here's what our data could look like. The pluses are positive instances. The minuses are negative instances. And the, a true optimal linear hypothesis might be this dark green line. We're going to ignore that true, linear, the true best linear classifier and instead look only at these linear classifiers that are perpendicular to alpha. And the reason to see, the, the reason this is an okay thing to do is to notice that any individual on one of these perpendicular lines can move along this boundary without any cost. So if you're going to admit one point on one of these level curves, you should admit all of them. That's why it's without loss to consider this particular form of classifier. Now, once you've constrained yourself to considering this form of classifier, there would be one which would be optimal in the absence of manipulation. Maybe it's this blue one here. What the move the goalposts classifier says is take that optimal classifier and note that individuals would actually manipulate to try and get classified. So if you want to classify the way that optimal classifier would, but in the presence of manipulation, you need to guard against manipulation. So select three rather than two here. So that's the move the goalpost classifier. Um, hard, and all, hard at all show that a variant of this mechanism is effective even in more general settings than this. And furthermore, not, they're not, hold on, sorry, I've got a lot of G-chat. Go away. Apologies. Okay, so hard at all show that the move the goalposts classifier is near optimal in a much more general setting than the one we're considering. And furthermore, there are several other papers that consider similar setups and reach similar conclusions. So this is a natural thing to do. So once you've decided that you want to use the move the goalposts classifier then, a natural question is, what are the social consequences? And I want to spend some time talking about some of the results in that vein. In particular, a paper of Millie et al. asks, if you are classifying in this way, how does this affect inequality? Does this treat vulnerable populations fairly? So in particular, they consider a notion of group fairness. So you can imagine that the population in addition to having their features and their label based on their income, also has some immutable label A or B, which is their group membership, which is publicly observable. And for purposes of thinking about this, you should think of A as being a less vulnerable majority, and you can think about B as being a more vulnerable minority, although we will make these definitions precise in just a minute when we define inequality. And now you can ask, do we treat A and B fairly? And one way of measuring this is to look at the welfare of the people who should be recipients of benefits, so the positive labels. And for each of those, we can condition on being a positive label and being a member of A or B. And we can ask, how does the utility of these rightful recipients in each of these two groups differ? We'll call that the welfare disparity of our classifier. Once you've defined inequality or welfare disparity, then you can start working with concrete notions of inequality. And Millie et al. consider two. So the first one assumes that individuals are differently able to manipulate the mechanism. So it's inequality in costs. So you can assume that group A has a cost function much like what we just discussed. It's linearly separable. But group B, while they do have a linearly separable cost function with the same shape as that of group A, it has a different scale. So their costs are scaled up by a factor of rho. So people in group B have more difficulty filling out forms, for example. Another notion of inequality you can consider is a distributional one. We call this inequality in features. So Let's let the likelihood function of a set of features X be the probability that someone with those features has a positive label according to our underlying distribution D. 
then our distributional inequality, our inequality in features, says that conditioning on being a positive label, population A has a likelihood distribution which first order stochastically dominates population B. So we have inequality in costs and inequality distributionally. In other words, for this latter definition of inequality, an individual in group A is more likely to be appealing to a classifier than an individual in, in, in group B. So having defined those notions of inequality, we can then ask, how is inequality affected by the use of mechanisms, classifiers, which guard against strategic manipulation? So let's draw our picture from before. Recall that we had some, uh, dis some classifier of the form alpha dot x that was optimal in the absence of manipulation, which is labeled two in this picture. And we had another one, which was after you guarded against manipulation. So this is the no guarding classifier. And this is the classifier, which is guarded against strategic behavior. What Millie et al. show is that as you move from no guarding to a guarded classifier, a classifier that protects it against strategic manipulation, the welfare disparity under either of these inequality notions increases. In other words, there's a direct trade-off between the amount to which you exacerbate inequality and the extent to which your classifier is vulnerable to manipulation. Sam, you want to take two questions? I would love to take questions. Okay, so one question is um, from Richard Cole. So I think the two group model is far from reality. Um, really, there is a spectrum from vulnerable to non vulnerable. So one should not care so much about errors near the chosen boundary line. So that's one question. It's about the two group model. The other mm -hmm. one is from Red. It's um, Is there evidence that vulnerable population do more manipulation than the not vulnerable population? So, okay, so let's uh, think about Richard's question first. So, um, I'm a little bit unclear whether the question is asking whether the A and B model, the two groups model, is is not accurate or not or is accurate or not because I I certainly agree that it's an oversimplification. But I think there are also natural ways of modifying this framework to think about less uh, less coarse notions of group inequality. Um, mm, yeah, in which case, I'm not really sure what the question is. Um, Richard, feel free to re-ask. Um, um, regarding Rediot's question, um, the way I think about this is based in the things that Sarah talked about in the previous session. So Sarah gave a lot of, lot of evidence that actually it's harder to do the sorts of manipulation that are often really relevant for things like SSDI, where you need your forms to be the right forms and they need to be filled out correctly and they need to be done in such a way that they're um, currying to what the examiners, examiners are looking for. Um, and that's a lot harder to do if you have a large cognitive burden, for example, from poverty. Um, yeah, so does that handle the questions? Thanks, Sam. Yep. Great. Unless okay. If anyone has any follow up, I'll see it in chat. Fantastic. Okay. So the conclusion here is that if you want to guard your classifier against manipulation, you may be doing so at the expense of creating more inequality. A natural question to ask next is are there interventions that can alleviate this problem? And in a paper of who at all, they consider exactly this question in our setting. So they work under the assumption that there's inequality in costs. So group B has a harder time manipulating. And they consider a very natural intervention. What if you subsidized manipulation by group B? So before group B had this additional scale factor of rho, which made manipulation more costly. Let's subsidize the manipulation by group B and at an additional scale factor beta, which makes it less costly. And the problem now is that we will pay 
we'll foot the bill for manipulation as the learner. So you can think about this as if someone comes into your office and they're obviously from group B, you'll help them fill out their forms. So in their model, they, they assume that the learner actually internalizes this cost as part of their objective. So now they're trying to maximize the probability that they get the right label minus the costs from subsidizing group B. And now they ask, does this actually help inequality? What are the social consequences of this sort of intervention? And their answer is quite surprising. They show that there are actually ways of setting this up such that the learner is able to improve their classification error. Having this subsidy only gives them another knob to turn, another tool in their toolbox. But once they set their classifier and their subsidies up optimally, this is actually worse for all members of both populations. So this intervention has unintended side effects. Um, so that's all I want to say about strategic classification. Um, this is a relatively new body of literature. So there are lots of open questions here that I think are really interesting. So this subsidies intervention was, has been sort of the only one considered so far, but there's lots of other room, there's lots of room for other ways of trying to alleviate the impact on inequality of guarding your mechanism against manipulation. Um, in particular, right now, our interventions themselves are targeted in a categorical way. We give you a subsidy if you're in group B. But you could imagine other ways of targeting subsidies or other interventions within group B, for example. Um, we also made the assumption in this model that manipulation is strictly bad. It makes manipulation harder, and that's the only way it shows, or it makes targeting harder, but that's the only way it shows up in the objective function for the learner. There are a couple of papers that consider requirements like sending your children to school or taking up certain health interventions, where the welfare consequences of manipulation in these ways is actually positive. Um, so Kleinberg and Raghavan and Hochtel et al. consider manipulation where the learner actually wa wants to incentivize certain manipulation behaviors. And that requires a different uh, way of thinking about the problem, which I don't have time to get into. There are lots of open questions here. So oh, Sam, there's a follow-up from Richard, um, right. and it's about um, if one can only manipulate a little, um, then only those that are close to the boundaries will effectively manipulate, sure. and this doesn't seem to be the kind of manipulation that one should care about. So, on the one hand, um, well, no, okay, so I, I, think I, I think I just disagree with that. Um, so, there's a fair amount of evidence, at least in the way that these uh, policies distort labor supply, that there's a fair cost to this. Um, it might be a cost that's worthwhile, but there is a pretty large cost, at least in the distortion of labor supply around these income cutoffs, for example. Um, for other types of manipulation, that may be the case, that it's not, it's not worth it, it's kind of small beans, but there certainly are forms of manipulation that even around the margin, it's socially impactful. Um, Great, thanks for following up, Richard. Okay, so in the time I have left, I wanna talk about now community-based targeting. And in particular, I wanna talk about a paper of Alatus et al. Um, the goal of this paper is to compare community-based targeting to a proxy means test and things like cost and accuracy. And because this is the goal of the study, they have a ton of really rich data. So, um, Oops, there we go. So they collected data, first of all, as the baseline. They collected a survey of community members' consumption. They collected social habits, who they talked to when. And they had community members give impressions of other people in their community's wealth. They randomly assigned a treatment of community-based targeting or proxy means testing. And in those community meetings they used, for their targeting. They had detailed records of what happened in those meetings, and that's part of their data set. And then they had all of the data associated with running a proxy means test. And because they have this rich set of data, 
they were able to make a lot of really interesting observations, which I think suggest some good open questions in this space. So I want to walk through some of their observations in the last few minutes I have. OK, so the first observation comes from the way the meetings were run in their study. So they use participatory wealth rank ranking. So they had an open invitation community meeting where they talked about what it means to be poor, what it means to be wealthy. And then as a full group, they went through and ranked every member of the community by wealth. And the way they did this was they had every household's name written on a note card. And they literally had a clothesline going across the room where they would pin these note cards to the clothesline and slowly build an order. And the way they, they would build their order is with pairwise comparisons. So when they had a new household B that they needed to rank, they would ask, who is more wealthy, B or A? And the meeting would come to a consensus, and that would determine the placement of B. And then they would have another member, C. And they would ask, who is more wealthy, C or B? C was more wealthy. OK, who is more wealthy, C or A? A is more wealthy, so C goes in the middle, and so on. And so initially, they did some sort of sequential search for the position of each su subsequent note card when the list was short. And then when things got longer, they did a binary search for the correct location. So they would compare to the middle person, and then they would compare to the person at the one fourth or three quarters quantile, and so on. Okay, so this process was really thorough. They ended up making every comparison they need to get a perfect ordering, basically. Um, and they consensed on most of these comparisons, but it was quite time consuming. So the paper says that these meetings ended up taking north of an hour and a half on average. And so, what, in, what kind of information was on the note cards? There's a question. It was just the names. So this was based on, solely on what these people knew about each other. So, but there was discussion once the name was announced and uh, as the next person to be ranked. They had to discuss who, how they should be ranked. Okay. So because these meetings went so long, a really natural question is, did people get tired? Were they ranking in the, were they producing rankings of the same quality at minute 61 that they were at minute one? Or did the targeting accuracy degrade during the meeting? And fortunately, a lot of us at all had the foresight to randomize the ordering of these note cards in each meeting, meaning they could actually figure out how the targeting error changed over time. So this plot gives the quantile in their order in, uh, in the meeting. So if your quantile is zero, you are the first note card to be ranked. And if your quantile is one, you are the last note card to be ranked. And plots that against the probability that they were mistargeted. So we observed their true consumption. And this is the, this is the probability that they were eligible but did not receive benefits. And you can see that at the beginning, the mistargeting rate is actually quite good. But then as the meeting creeps on, it gets longer. This is especially interesting when you notice, when you consider that in this early stage, the community-based targeting is actually doing better than proxy means testing. So whether or not this is a better approach actually may hinge on this kind of fatigue. So the protocol they chose for this ranking was skewed towards thoroughness and away from expediency. You might ask if there is another way of designing the protocol that doesn't skew quite in this direction that would do better here because of this fatigue. Um, so the first observation I want to make is that the design of the protocol here matters. OK, so the next question that a lot of us at all ask is whether the community members were incorporating different information than the proxy means test, or even whether they were incorporating some of the same information, but weighting it differently. In other words, in this definition of poor that the community had in their head, were they maximizing the same welfare function that the proxy means test was? So the way they measured this was they looked at the ranking of individuals according to their PMP scores. And they looked at the ranking of individuals according to the community-based targeting scores, or their ranking in these community meetings. And they regressed both of these rankings on a variety of features. So you can look here. Um, they regressed the ranking on log per capita consumption. And you can see that both proxy means test and communities 
uh, tended to rank people with more wealth as wealthier, which is to be expected. And they also agreed on some other things like elite connectedness, and there's a variety of other features here, but they also disagreed on some unexpected features. So the proxy means test measured inequality on a per capita basis, but it seems like in communities, in, in the community meetings, they assumed that large households were able to get some sort of returns to scale. So this first red box shows that they actually tended to view large houses as being less wealthy. Um, Another interesting point of disagreement was whether or not someone was an ethnic minority. So overall, the proxy means test barely made ethnic minorities a little bit more likely to be ranked higher. But it seems like the communities ranked people who are ethnic minorities as less wealthy. In other words, there may have been some awareness of bias or discrimination that these people were facing that made them less well off. So from these tables, it seems like actually the community is maximizing a different welfare function than the one being measured by the PMT. Um, and this is either really intriguing because it means that there's maybe some sort of agency problem to be solved here, or possibly kind of inspiring. This is social choice at work here. So that's the second observation. The community maximizes its own welfare function. And then the last observation is comes from a subsequent study where they used the network data they collected in their uh, initial surveys. And they used this data to um, come to five realizations about people's impressions of each other's wealth. The observations were that if you are more likely to interact someone, with someone, you're more likely to rank them accurately, to accurately judge their wealth. Um, if someone is more socially central, they're more likely to have accurate impressions of other people's wealth. Sometimes people say that they don't know, Sometimes people who do say they know actually don't know. But if you are less proximate to someone socially, you generally are more likely to say you don't know. And all five of these are reasonable evidence that the way the community is learning is from information being passed along their social network. And it seems furthermore that this information transmission is noisy. So the question you can ask, I'm really not doing good with my animations here. Um, the question you can ask is, can you use this to in some way determine from network structure whether community-based targeting is the right thing to do? Can you predict targeting accuracy based on network structure? And in this paper, they do two things. First, they take a sort of complex approach where they fit a structural model for learning on networks and then use simulations based on this fitted model to predict how well each of these village networks would do a diffusion and then see if that predicts the targeting accuracy among these villages. They also take a less fine-grained approach where they identified some coarse properties of networks like average degree or clustering coefficient and regressed the targeting, targeting accuracy of the villages on these properties. But in either case, they found that you can use network structure to predict whether community-based targeting is going to work well. So the final observation is that network structure matters a lot. Okay, so I wanna wrap up by noting that there are a bunch of really interesting open questions related to these observations. So we observed that protocol design matters. So one question to ask is, could we better trade off the thoroughness of the learning being done by our protocol against the fatigue experience from what is essentially query complexity? Another interesting question is related to observation two. So if we know that the community is maximizing a social welfare function that's different from what we would maximize under proxy means testing, this means that maybe we should be doing our targeting differently. How can we better learn to target and target to maximize a community's welfare function rather than the one that's coming down from on high? And then finally, these, the last observation has some interesting questions. Like if I give you the network structure, can you predict in either an analytical or um, statistical way whether community-based targeting will work well? Or are there some easier to measure network properties, easier to measure than the full network structure that are predictive of community-based targeting success? Um, these are all really interesting questions that I think the EC community could make some progress on. Okay, so that's where I want to wrap things up. Um, before we get to Q&A though, I wanna thank a couple of people. I think the EC tutorial chairs, Siegel and Brendan, deserve some credit for uh, 
setting this all up. They've done a great job. Um, the leadership and the mechanism design for social good initiative have been really helpful in all of this. Um, special thanks to Rediot, who this was her idea basically, and Irene and, Ana, and Andrea uh, Stoika both were very helpful. And then all of this work came out of work of the MD4SG Inequality Group. Um, so special thanks to Zoe Hitzig and Angela Zhao for a lot of the paper recommendations at the early stages.